opportunity to connect. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's very fine, and uh, we are very happy. I think all the participants will be uh, in, will enjoy your lecture and will gain a lot of things. Uh, how is your IIT? Uh, you, you are there in uh, Indore, ma? Yeah, yeah. IIT, IIT Indore. IIT Indore. So classes are open or uh, still? No, we are taking online classes only. Online classes, okay. So, Dr. Gupta, you can introduce Madam to all the participants and uh, start the session today. Uh, yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. So, before starting this uh, second lecture of the third day IFDP, I would like to introduce uh, our expert to all the participants. Uh, so, Dr. Trapti Jain received the BE degree in Electrical Engineering from Government Engineering College Ujjain in 1997. And she obtained her PhD degree in Electrical Engineering from IIT Kanpur in 2008. She is currently an uh, associate professor in Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Indore. Before joining IIT Indore in uh, June 2012, she served as an assistant professor in the School of Computing and Electrical Engineering at IIT Mandi from December 2010 to uh, 8 June 2012. She has also served in the Electrical Engineering Department at Madhav Institute of Technology and Science, Gwalior, from May 99 to November 2010. Her research interests include synchrophasure applications in power system, grid integration of renewable energy system, artificial intelligence application in power system, and data analytics in smart grid. So with this uh, brief uh, introduction, I am handing over session to you, ma'am. So uh, over to you, ma'am. Yeah, so thank you so much, Dr. Gupta, for such a nice intro introduction. Um, before starting this presentation, I would just like to know whether my voice is clearly uh, audible or not. Yes, yeah, it's clear. Clearly. OK, OK, thank you. So I'll share my presentation. Yeah. Uh, can you see? Yeah, it, it is available. Yes, the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So good morning, everyone. So uh, first of all, like I'm really surprised to see because the number of participants are more than 100. So this is the first time like in the on online program also, I'm finding it out that it is the first time that so many participants are there and they are attending so sincerely. Like in most of the cases I have seen that the register number of candidates will be more, but only few will be attending this thing. So I'm really happy to see a large uh, participation so, okay, so my today's topic is like uh, stability analysis and control of microgrid. So I have divided my presentation. I have divided my presentations into five, uh, like four major parts. First is like we are going to discuss what is microgrid and it, what components it should have. And uh, after discussing the various components available in the microgrids, we will go to discuss like controls in microgrids because see the control in power system is also very important. And in microgrids, it becomes much more important because the system is small and even a small disturbance can make your system unstable. So after uh, looking like what kind of controls are employed in microgrids, which are quite similar in structure to the conventional power system, we'll discuss what uh, uh, why stability is important in microgrids. And considering the stability, uh, basically I will consider a small signal stability. After looking at the small signal stability problem, we will see how we should design a controller Although different types of controllers can be designed and I will I have taken one particular controller and I'll explain a lot of components are involved in this design part and um, I will not uh, I'll try not to go in the much of the mathematics of that part, but the major steps required to design a controller that should be clear. So I'll try to do that and then finally conclude. So. Let us start with microgrids. So what are 
microgrids. So this concept of microgrids, it was proposed somewhere in early 2000, and this was proposed as a solution for reliable integration of renewable energy sources. So we all know that renewable energy sources, they have a problem with them because they are intermittent in nature. It means they are not always available and they are volatile in nature. Volatile means the fluctuations of the output fluctuations are much more. So because of this, uh, their nature of intermittency and volatility, uh, we cannot connect them in a like large quantity. Listen, because uh, the one important uh, function in the power system is like the power should be balanced always. Both active and reactive power balance should be maintained always. Listen. So this intermittency and volatile nature of these renewable energy sources creates a problem. So there are a concept of microgrid was proposed that uh, this microgrid will be a mini, uh, will be a small grid where a small capacity generations will be there and small loads will be there, but it will be provided with a capacity that it can be islanded, it can be disconnected from the utility grid and it can be connected also. So that flexibility is given. So basically a microgrid, it comprises of low voltage distributed systems with distributed generation units. Then to maintain uh, the power balance, this electrical energy storage devices, they play a very important role in microgrid. So we have storage devices is also a must in microgrid. Then we have different kinds of loads and interconnecting switches. So the important feature of microgrid is that it can be operated in grid connected or islanded mode. Okay. So in grid connected mode, what will happen in grid connected mode, uh, this whatever is suppose we have a power deficit here in the grid connected mode, then we don't need to bother about it because that power deficit can be taken from the utility main grid. And if we have excess power during this grid connected mode, then this excess power can be traded with the utility grid. So we don't need to bother about the power imbalance situation. Okay. But when it is operating in the islanded mode, so it operates autonomously and then it is the responsibility of the microgrid to maintain the voltage and frequency within the limit because the power balance should be maintained. See, whenever the real and reactive power balances are not matched, in that case, you will observe the deviations in frequency and voltage. So when the microgrid is operating in islanded mode, it is the responsibility of the microgrid to maintain the voltage and frequency within the specified limits. And therefore, we can say that the power balance should be maintained. Okay, but if it is operating in the grid connected mode, then it does not need to bother because the utility grid will take care of these things. Okay, so now to maintain power balance specifically, so we have these controllers here. These controllers, you can consider these controllers as the master uh, controller or microgrid central controller. So these controllers basically, they control the operation of microgrid to ensure reliable and economical and smooth operation. Okay, so like if these controllers will decide that whether the power will be exchanged with the utility grid or not. Okay, so this power exchange will be controlled by this controllers if it is islanded, so islanding needs to be take place, this will be decided by this controller. Then all this uh, uh, economical scheduling of uh, these uh, like uh, generations, renewable energy generations or storage uh, systems present in the microgrid, everything will be decided by this controller. So these controllers are basically responsible for managing or for secure and stable operation of the microgrid. So these are also very important part. So all these uh, parts will be there in a microgrid. Now let us see what are the major components of microgrid. So the major components of microgrid are loads, DERs, which is like a distributed energy resources, smart switches, protective devices, master controller, then communication also, and control and automation systems. Okay. So um, Loads, microgrid loads can be classified into two types, flex, fixed loads and flexible loads. 
So fixed loads means there are certain types of loads uh, in this uh, microgrid which cannot, which needs to have uninterruptible power supply all the time. Okay. So therefore, we are calling it as fixed loads because uh, these loads cannot be altered and they should be satisfied under any operating conditions. So these kind of loads are given the highest priority in the microgrid. Such kind of loads like we can say hospitals, nursing facilities or dispatch, uh, dispatch sections. So all these uh, are under fixed loads. Okay. So because we cannot control these loads, we also call as uncontrollable loads or critical loads or non-responsive loads. Uncontrollable loads because we cannot control these kind of loads. Critical because uh, these kind of loads have to be served at any cost. You cannot perform load shedding with this kind of loads. So while uh, preparing for any strategy, you have to take into account that this much amount of load is a critical load. And even in islanding condition, the first priority should be given to the critical loads or non-responsive because depending upon the operating condition of the microgrid, they are not responding. They are like they need some fixed amount of power. So they, it, they are also called non-responsive loads. Okay. Then the next category of loads is flexible loads. Flexible loads because we can control them. If we do not have sufficient power generation, then in that case, we can cut this kind of load. So these kind of loads, they are known as controllable loads or non-critical loads or responsive loads also. So in this also, we can uh, divide these flexible loads into two categories, like one is shiftable loads and the other is curtailable loads. So shiftable loads means they could be deferred. So like suppose uh, we are using energy storage system. So energy storage system, they are uh, taking power to charge them. And then if they are charged, if, and the, if the power is extra power is needed, these storage systems can be used to deliver the power to the grid, isn't it? So these are known as shiftable loads because if, uh, uh, means, uh, if uh, your operating condition is such that you need power, you cannot deliver uh, power at this moment of time, so you can utilize the energy stored in the storage systems. Okay? So basically all these storage systems or EVs or PEVs, you can consider them as shiftable loads or responsive loads okay because they are responding according to the uh, operating condition of the microgrid the next category is we can uh, they are only consuming uh, the power they are not able to deliver the power back to the grid so that category of loads is known as curtailable loads okay so if you do not have sufficient power generation in that case you perform load shedding with the, uh, those kind of Loads. We are not supplying any power to those loads. So examples can be like refrigeration and uh, washing machines in our homes. All these kind of loads, if we do not have sufficient power generation, we can curtail these kind of loads. Okay. So these are known as curtailable loads. Now microgrids DER, so distributed energy resources. Uh, they include not only DGs, because here what is happening, you are using energy storage system also, which can supply power to the microgrid, and you are using responsive loads also, like PVs. So they also, they are also, because delivering at some point of time, they are also delivering power to the grid, so they are considered as distributed energy resources. Okay, now... In the DGs which we use in microgrid, they can be categorized as dispatchable and non-dispatchable. So dispatchable means we can control the output of such kind of units. And uh, obviously these will be subjected to certain technical constraints like uh, ramping uh, limit, capacity limit, minimum on or off time limit. So some limits, technical limits will be there, but we can control their output. Okay, and the other category is non-dispatchable. So non-dispatchable means we are not able to control the output here because the input itself is not controllable. So obviously the renewable energy sources will come under non-dispatchable. Okay, now as I told you earlier that because and we all know that re renewable energy sources they are associated with like intermittent nature and volatile nature. So because of this thing, it is important to have energy storage systems in the microgrid. 
Okay. And these energy storage systems, basically whatever flexibility microgrid has to operate, it is, it is coming because of the energy storage systems. Because if you are deficit in power, you can utilize the energy stored in these storage systems and you have excess, then you can store the excess energy in this storage system. So these are the, these ESS, they are providing flexibility to the microgrid. And they can be used for various applications in microgrid, like energy arbitrage, frequency regulation, load leveling. So what is energy arbitrage? Energy arbitrage means you are storing the energy in the storage systems when the price is less. And then you are selling this energy when the market price is high. So this is known as like energy arbitrage. Now frequency regulation and load leveling, how can we use ESS for frequency regulation and load leveling? I will show you in the next slide. So this is in this figure, you can see that this is the grid frequency. Okay, so we always want grid frequency to be maintained within a band. So here you can consider that the band is like 59.95 to 60.05 hertz. At each, uh, any time, this frequency should be maintained within this band. So if you see here, this frequency here, it is within band. But at this point, so we are not, uh, this ESS, they are not either charging and not discharging. Okay, so here it is constant. Okay. Now, once this frequency is going above, frequency is going above, it means the load is less and generation is more. Okay, so since the generation is more to, to add more load in the system, this ESS starts charging. So this is how during this period when it is charging, it is bringing back this frequency in this band. Okay. And once this is coming in this band, again, it is not taking any power. Neither it is delivering nor it is taking. And then again, it comes down. When the frequency is coming down here, it means that the generation is less and load is more. So here, this is discharging. Now the ESS has a start delivering power to the grid. So this is how this energy storage systems can help in maintaining frequency regulation. Now load leveling. So we always want that load also should be um, rather than having peaks and valleys in the load curve, we would like to have it within a certain band so which can be easily controlled. Okay, so yeah. So here if we see the band is assumed to be 5 to 10 megawatt, it should be maintained within this band, load should be maintained within this band. So now in this part, initial part, what is happening? The load is going down and we need to maintain it in this band. So what we are doing, this ESS starts charging so that load increases to above 5 megawatt. So this is how it is charging here. Now when, when this uh, load is maintained within this band, then it is not taking any energy and not delivering any energy. So again, it goes up and it starts discharging. We want to reduce the load here, so it starts discharging. So this is how we can use ESS for load leveling. And now smart switches and protective devices. So we all know that protective devices are needed in the system to if like uh, suppose if, if a fault occurs in the microgrid, then these protective devices will identify the faulty section and then I uh, prevent its propagation in the microgrid. And uh, so this smart switches, they are also managing the connection between DERs and loads in the microgrid by connecting and disconnecting them. And the switch at the PCC, this performs microgrid islanding by disconnecting the microgrid from the utility grid, which we have seen in the previous slide where I've shown you uh, isolation switch, which if we close it, it will be connected to the utility grid. So this uh, switch is used to connect and to island the microgrid from the utility grid. So now this is master controller. So this master controller, it performs microgrid scheduling in grid connected and islanded modes. Uh, considering economic and security constraints. So as we know that uh, 
all the uh, power generating plants in the conventional power system also we need to schedule them beforehand so we need to know the loads and accordingly the uh, loads at various uh, uh, during the we, we usually consider 24 hour uh, load so for that known load or forecasted load we perform scheduling of the generation similarly the microgrid it is also performing scheduling in grid connected and islanded modes means if so it knows beforehand due to fault if islanding is happening that time it will manage automatically but if during uh, it is planned uh, due to some planned thing islanding is happening that time also it will perform scheduling okay so the economical constraints also need to be considered and the security also needs to be considered basically an optimization problem is formulated where the objective would be to minimize the operational cost and satisfy the security constraints and that is how this uh, set points means uh, these two, uh, set points of the responsive loads generation devices and uh, storage devices all these uh, set points will be decided by the master controller then it determines the microgrid interaction with the utility grid so uh, microgrid interaction it means it exchanges information with the utility grid about the status of various generating sources in the microgrid, uh, various energy storage systems in the microgrid. So all this information it exchanges with the utility grid and it also gets similar kind of information from the utility grid. Okay. So now the decision whether the microgrid needs to operate in grid connected mode or islanded mode needs to be taken care by master controller. So it manages optimal operation of all local resources. That is the main function you can say as the master uh, main function of master controller. Now, communications control and automation systems are required to implement the control actions and to ensure constant, effective, and reliable interaction among microgrid components. So whatever control strategies are implemented, that should be automated. So here we have discussed uh, uh, briefly like uh, the various components of the microgrids and what are their functions. Okay. Now let us see what are the control objectives in microgrid. Okay. So uh, the control objectives basically if we see, uh, we want to implement the control uh, strategies when the microgrid is operating in grid connected mode and when it is operating in islanded mode. So in both the cases, but in both the cases, these controls are not implementing this control uh, techniques is not easy. It is very challenging. Okay. Now, uh, the first uh, control objective is like we know that the microgrid, it operates, uh, uh, operates in grid connected mode when it is connected to the utility grid. Okay. Now, suppose, um, there is some fault in the utility grid and due to that fault in the utility grid what happens this microgrid is disconnected so it is operating in the islanded mode okay now once so if it is operating in the islanded mode it means it is losing synchronism with the utility grid and once the event which has created islanding it disappears in the uh, utility grid the switch provided at the uh, PCC, that's, it will try to reconnect this microgrid with the utility grid. So to reconnect it with the utility grid, we first need to synchronize this microgrid. Okay, so voltage and frequency of the microgrid should match the voltage and frequency of the utility grid. So to obtain this, um, all the DGs present in the microgrid need to be controlled properly in a coordinated way to ensure smooth reconnection of the microgrid and all these DGs they should adjust their power cooperatively so that this microgrid is able to track the voltage and frequency of the utility grid. So we need a control strategy for this part. Then we need to, as I told that the maintaining power balance between the generation and the load in islanded mode of operation is very important. Okay. So we need control techniques to uh, maintain this power generation, power balance always. Then to maintain stable voltage and frequency in the microgrid, to maintain quality of power injected into the utility grid, and to harness maximum power from various renewable energy sources. So these are the few 
objectives of control system which will be utilized in the microgrid. Okay. Now, this control strategy, it is implemented at two levels. One is system level, like as I told microgrid central controller, so that is at system level. And then each component will have its own control. So at component level, we have microsource controller, energy storage system controller, and load controller. Okay, because we have responsive loads also. So we need load controller also. So microgrid central controller. So microgrid central controller, so it provides power set points for the DG units. So how much power will be generated at particular moment of time by various DGs present in the microgrid. So it will decide this. Then it will perform economic scheduling. As I told in the previous slide, that it will perform economic scheduling. Then to control peak load, it can control peak load like if the sufficient uh, power generation is not available, certain loads can be curtailed and which will be decided by this MGCC. Okay, to control non-critical loads during islanding, to minimize system losses, then to detect islanding conditions based on the measurements at the PCC. See, it is very important to predict islanding. Okay. Because the control techniques which will be which we will be using in the microgrid that depend upon the mode of operation. So as soon as the islanding happens, it is very important to detect that islanding has happened. Okay. Then to initiate resynchronization with the local controllers when the grid is restored, and to monitor power flows through local generating units and the PCC and to make islanding decision. So you can consider it like whatever are the main um, objectives to or what are the whatever the main functions related to ensuring the um, secure, reliable and economical operation of microgrid. All those functions, they are performed by microgrid central controller. Then we have micro sources control methods. So uh, this control, like it will depend upon whether your microgrid is operating in grid connected mode or it is operating in islanded mode. So if the microgrid is operating in grid connected mode, then we use this PQ control method. So in this PQ control method, the set points will be provided by the utility grid. Like utility grid will inform that how much real power generation is needed from the microgrid and how much reactive power generation will be needed by the from the microgrid. Okay, so this P and Q will be um, obtained from the utility grid. Now, in the islanded mode of operation, we have two types, two kind of techniques can be used. One is like droop control, and the other is V by F control. So we can consider this to be similar to like we have a primary and secondary control in conventional power system. Okay, so uh, this drip control and VBAF control also forms a similar kind of thing. So this is primary control. This drip control is the primary control. And uh, so uh, this control usually will be activated when there is a small disturbances. Okay, so for a small disturbances, drip control will take care of things. So in droop control also, we have PF droop control and QV droop control. So these techniques are also similar to the conventional synchronous generator. There also we are using droop characteristic to um, uh, minimize the small deviations in the voltage and frequency. So similarly here we use like to maintain frequency within the limits. This uh, real power control is used and to maintain voltage within the limits, we use reactive power control. Okay. So this, but these things will be when there is only a small signal disturbance. If the disturbance is large, then we need to shift from drip control to V by F control. So basically this V by F control, it uses PI and PID controllers to uh, minimize the voltage and frequency deviations caused due to um, large disturbances. Okay, large disturbances like some generators may uh, trip off, it is not generating or some line may be out so these kind of disturbances can be considered as large disturbances, whereas like small load disturbances, they can be considered as small signal disturbances and their drip control will be participating. So as we see here, uh, this uh, the control strategy should be autonomous. So when we design the controllers, it should be like when the microgrid shifts from grid connected mode to islanded mode, then 
automatically this PQ control, the control uh, should be shifted. The control should be sh automatically shifted from PQ control to drip control if it is a small signal disturbance and from drip control to V by F control if it is a large signal disturbance. Okay. Um, so now energy storage system and load controller. So energy storage system, it should be controlled to absorb or release power quickly because see, energy storage system are mainly helping us in maintaining the power balance. Isn't it? So whenever this power balance is not there or it is offset, in that case, uh, it, should it should be able to absorb or release the power quickly so that this, uh, uh, this influence of fluctuations or temporary mismatch in power uh, balance can be reduced. Their influence can be reduced on the utility grid. Okay. The charging and discharging of the storage system, this can be controlled. This will depend basically when you are deciding that whether the storage system will charge or discharge. So this will depend upon the grid operating conditions and state of charge of the hybrid storage system. So these two points will control whether the storage system will be charging or discharging. And then we should have load controller to shed the non-critical loads in case of power imbalance, which is particularly in the islanded mode of operation, because if it is operating in grid connected mode, the large grid will uh, take care of everything. Okay. So uh, now this is like control hierarchy. What is the control hierarchy in microgrid? So we usually use a hierarchical control structure. So here, like as you can see, uh, this is like primary level control. We have divided this control, uh, this hierarchical structure in three levels. So one is like this primary level control, then this is secondary level control and tertiary level control. So it is similar to the one which we use in uh, conventional power system. Okay, so these controls, they differ on their speed of response and the time frame in which they operate. Okay, and also differ in communication infrastructure requirements. So the first level is the primary level control. So it it is the uh, it gives the fastest response and it operates on the time scale of the order of 10 to 100 milliseconds. Okay. So if some disturbance happens, this is the first one to respond. It will respond basically for small disturbances, but it is the first one to respond. So um, it does not, it uses only local measurements. Okay. And it, uh, it uses only local measurements and it doesn't have any requirement of communication infrastructure. So therefore, for this purpose, like as we discussed in the previous slide, micro sources control methods, these control methods, power sharing control, voltage and current control and islanding detection also, it comes under primary, primary level control. Okay, because it operates very fast. Then the next level of control is secondary control. So this secondary level control, we can consider, we call it as energy management system also. So basically it is this control which ensures the reliable, secure and economical operation of this um, microgrid. Okay, so uh, this secondary level control, so here power quality will also be there voltage and frequency restoration and power flow or synchronization control, all these will come under secondary level control. So it is little slower in comparison to primary level control and it operates on the order of like one to 10 seconds. This is the time frame in which it will operate. Okay. So uh, basically, uh, if uh, the voltage and frequency deviations are caused by any primary level control, the secondary level control will compensate those voltage and frequency deviations. Okay, so whatever frequency and deviations are introduced by the primary level control, all these voltage and frequency deviations will be compensated by the secondary level control. And further, this power sharing control now, so what if um, the load sharing ratio also, it can be corrected by this secondary level control. If it founds that there is some imp improvement needed in this load sharing control, this secondary level can control can do that also. 
then above that tertiary level control comes so in tertiary level control uh, this uh, basically it is the top level of the control okay and it operates in the order of like few minutes okay so it performs the overall responsibility of tertiary level control is microgrid supervision generation forecasting economic dispatch and optimal management of microgrid okay so this the major uh, responsibilities are associated with tertiary level control in this control it will con also control the power exchanged with the main grid okay so these are the three levels of uh, control structures in microgrid now architectures for secondary control okay so in literature we have seen that these four times four types of architectures have been uh, used like decentralized control centralized control distributed control and hierarchical control so the in decentralized control you will see that each I, this iidg means inverter interface dg unit so you will see that each inverter interface dg unit is having its own secondary control okay so this primary control is like drop control so this uh, each iidg unit is having its own drop control characteristic and then according to that drop control we have one more like secondary control so each iidg unit is having its own local secondary control now uh, if you see this secondary control so it is not uh, having any information about the actions of other iidg units okay it is not having any uh, information about the any system wide variable of microgrids it has only this local information about this iidg unit whereas it is observed that because this I actions of these iidg units they are correlated they are coupled okay so it is important to have some information about this iidg units also so that is the drawback with this decentralized control that it suffers from the lack of uniformity or consistency and coordination among iidg units they are not having any information about the actions taken by the other units so some uh, because this are coupled uh, the directions are coupled it is important to have some kind of coordination now we have centralized control of microgrids so in centralized control what we have we need a communication infrastructure okay so like this primary control is there for each iidg unit now all the data are gathered from these iidg units in this communication infrastructure and this secondary control it utilizes the information acquired in, through in this uh, dedicated controller so whatever information is collected from this iidg units that information will be used to decide the control actions for all all iidgs okay but the problems with this uh, centralized controller is that if there is this communication fails then this uh, centralized controller also will fail so it needs like as i mentioned here it needs a central computing and communication unit and which may suffer from single point failure so if it fails then this control cannot be um, activated then comes distributed control of microgrids so the drawback of decentralized controller has been overcome in this one so here each iidg unit is having its own secondary control and these secondary controls so they are exchanging information also okay so whatever was the drawback in decentralized control that is overcome here and then after distributed control we have hierarchical control of microgrids so in hierarchical control we are using like two two level controls one is like local secondary control is there and then this information is also collected here and a secondary uh, and a centralized secondary control is also um, there so here i finish this control part so any questions till now any question from the participants yes one question is there in the chat window should i uh, read the question ma'am uh, yeah i'll read 
one question no, is I, there. I could not see the question. In chat window. Uh, okay, they have yeah, sent yeah, me. Uh, in BI, BYF yeah. control, in BYF control usage of hmm. the ID controller, is it due to any specific hmm. region or any other controller also we can use? See, basically why it is used, see, V by F control is used only when large disturbance is there. Okay. So, uh, this PI controller, because it uh, helps in reducing any steady state error. Okay. So, that is the purpose we use with PI controller and PID controller. For V by F, uh, no other controller will be used. Okay. So, if uh, any other question, you may unmute uh, yourself and ask directly. Participants are requested to unmute and ask directly. Yes, ma'am. My question is, uh, yeah. what will be the control strategies if we integrate renewable energy system with the conventional energy system? Uh, see, if you integrate renewable energy system with the conventional, so see what will happen in the microgrid, like you may consider, some diesel generator like, is it? Yes, ma'am. Hello. Yeah. So like you can have in addition to renewable energy sources, you can have a uh, diesel generator also. So diesel generator will not use like a uh, drug control characteristic. See all these renewable energy sources when you are integrating them in the utility grid, uh, when you're integrating them in the grid, so what is happening, these renewable energy sources, they are uh, integrated through power electronic converters. Is it? Yes, ma'am. So uh, this drop characteristic is there, but this drop characteristic can be used only for like a small uh, generation. So drop characteristic can be used with uh, this one also. But depending upon the control objectives only, you need to change the control strategy. So that is why you cannot define a fixed controller. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Like you want to know that what kind of control techniques can be used, isn't? Yes, ma'am. So uh, what do you mean by like different control techniques? You need to explore what kind of structure will be useful. We cannot uh, uh, say that a part for a particular control technique that it will be uh, useful for uh, all the cases. Depending upon uh, the test system, like what components your test system is having, you need to explore the control techniques. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Like we have taken, I'll show you in the case study, we have taken one... Uh, test system and then we have uh, utilized different control strategies but i will be showing hierarchical control so maybe you may be able to understand yes, sir, anything else so i should move on to this stability Ma'am, if you wish, uh, you can take a break also in between uh, five minutes like that, if you wish. No, no, it is fine with me. Okay. Okay. So, so then we can shall continue. I continue? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Okay. So, uh, we have covered here, like, what are the control objectives in microgrids and uh, what is the structure of the hierarchical structure used in the microgrid and different types of secondary control structures which have been proposed in the literature okay so now we will see stability in microgrids so we all know that stability has been a very important uh, uh, concern in the conventional power system also but in microgrid it becomes much more vital concern because of the presence of multi energy source dgs with intermittent and uh, volatile nature okay and these energy sources they are interfaced with the grid through different kinds of power electronic converters so they do not offer any inertia so in the conventional power system we have uh, the synchronous generators big synchronous generators offer large inertia also in the system 
which improves the stability. But in the microgrids, the because we are using this um, uh, renewable energy sources, which are interfaced with the grid through power electronic converters, the inertia of this system is very less. Okay. And we have energy storage system and responsive loads also. So energy storage system also has like power electronic uh, converters. So these things create more problems in maintaining stability in microgrid. So if we consider AC microgrid, the stability issues are same, which we have in a conventional power system. So it is a small signal stability, transient stability and voltage stability. So let us first see what are the reasons for um, what are the reasons for instability in microgrid? So a small signal like for different problems, different reasons will be there. So like a small signal stability problem, it means it considers only a small disturbances, okay, which are usually the load disturbances. So this small signal stability problem and it, the uh, objective here is like uh, the system should be able to maintain the equilibrium operating state or reach equilibrium operating state after is subjected to a small disturbance. Okay. Now this small signal instability problem may occur because of the feedback controllers we use uh, in the microgrid or continuous load switching, load is changing continuously, insufficient system damping and power limit of DGs. These may cause a small signal stability problem. Now we may have transient stability problem also, which is related to like maintaining an operating uh, equilibrium operating point when it is subjected to a large disturbance. So these large disturbance can be considered as a fault with subsequent island. Some uh, section has been islanded, then loss of DGs. One of the generator has uh, gone out, so you do not have uh, the power that power generation is lost then fault in AC microgrids or large load changes. Okay, a small load changes that are continuous that they, they come under a small signal problem. But if suddenly some large load is either switched on or switched off, it may create transient stability problem. Then voltage stability problems. So voltage stability problems, um, they are usually we know that the voltage stability, voltage problems are caused by insufficient reactive power present in the system. Okay, so this voltage stability problems, basically it relates to maintaining a uh, steady state voltage or a voltage profile within a particular limit or a specified limit uh, under certain dis disturbances. Okay, so this voltage stability problem, it is, uh, it may be caused by reactive power limits or so current limiters, induction motor load dynamics tap changers and voltage regulators. They may create voltage stability problem in the microgrid. Now, how we can improve stability of AC microgrids? So to improve small signal stability, this can be achieved by having supplementary control loops or power system stabilizers or coordinated control of micro sources and energy management system. So see each thing is related to maintaining the power balance. Okay. And then transient stability improvement, it can be achieved by having control of energy storage system, the large power balance. Uh, if there is large power imbalance, then ESS should be controlled to maintain that uh, or to achieve that power balance. Then load shedding can be used to achieve the power balance, control of power electronic converters and adaptive protection devices. Okay, because if fault has happened, that needs to be segregated. So then adaptive protection devices needs. Then voltage stability improvement can be obtained with the help of like voltage regulation with DGs, reactive power compensation with the distributed facts devices, then advanced load controller or load shedding, modified control, uh, current limits of uh, current limiters of micro sources. Okay, so these methods can be used to improve stability. Now, um, Stability of microgrids, we know it is important concern, but as I told in the previous slides also that it is more important when the microgrid is operating in islanded mode of operation, because when it is connected with the utility grid, a bigger grid is there, 
which will take care of all the requirements of the microgrids okay so stability of microgrids it becomes much more important when it is operating in the islanded mode of operation so in the islanded mode these iitg units they are responsible for maintaining the frequency and voltage within their specified limits and also the uh, load sharing among the iitg units should be in a stable manner okay so the load sharing should be proper and then frequency and voltage should be maintained within the specified limits now uh, there are high chances that when a uh, microgrid is operating in islanded mode a large disturbance may make the system unstable okay but it is uh, but it is uh, but it is required that if because a small signal disturbance will happen continuously so it is required that your microgrid it should be able to maintain at least small signal stability okay so therefore this small signal stability it is a fundamental requirement for the satisfactory and reliable operation of in inverter interfaced microgrids okay so we have considered in our problem we have considered small signal stability now uh, how uh, to perform this small signal stability analysis of microgrids so first of all when we perform this analysis so we need to develop the mathematical model for different components okay so because it is a small signal stability analysis we develop a small signal state space model of different components like iidg units network and load and then after developing the small signal state space models of these different components we use mapping matrices to form a systematic state space model of the complete microgrid okay now when you perform this small signal stability analysis you have you need to linearize uh, uh, the non linear model of the microgrid and at a steady state operating point isn't it? small signal means we usually perform the analysis like this we have a non linear model and we have a initial steady state operating point and we linearize that non linear model around that operating point so uh, we this is we are developing this we have developed this state space models but we need to have initial steady state operating point also because this stability it depends upon the initial steady state operating point and it is also a function of the disturbance and the time during which this disturbance is present in the system so it is a function of all these three things so we need to obtain the steady state operating conditions so these steady state operating conditions can be obtained by either conventional power flow analysis or time step simulations or solving non linear algebraic equations by iterative algorithms solving systems differential equations or modified power different methods are there but we have used time step simulations okay now uh, then linearizations of equations for small signal stability once you obtain this steady state operating point then the equations are linearized around this steady state point and then we have used eigen value based analysis which is the most common method to uh, analyze the small signal stability so this is the test system we have taken so this is like uh, four iidg units have been taken and uh, like this microgrid so it is the frequ operating frequency is 50 hertz and the voltage is 230 volt per phase rms and these uh, dg sources so basically these dg sources uh, are considered maybe these dg sources may be like a photovoltaic source or a fuel cell or a micro turbine whatever so these are generating like dc so we have this voltage source inverter here three leg voltage source inverter is used here and this is the local control okay which is the primary level control uh, basically the drop control okay so this iidg unit a single iidg unit it comprises of these three parts and then we have like uh, this is an isolation switch which can be connected to operate it in the grid connected mode but we have not uh, operated we have considered islanded microgrid so it is open and then these three lines are there which are connected and it each first we have connected different types of load so basically considering that the load dynamics play uh, an important role in the stability of the system we have and we consider that microgrid will feed different kind of loads so we have considered here different types of loads like 
uh, induction motor load. Uh, in this particular problem, we have used um, induction motor load, constant power load at bus 2, and at bus 3, the rectifier interface active load, which is provided with its own local control. And then at the fourth bus, we have considered resistive load. Okay, so uh, this four IIDG units, they are different in ratings, but the uh, like the generation source is assumed to be same. So the ratings are different, and we have considered different types of loads to be connected here. So this uh, represents like IIDG unit model. So you see this IIDG unit model is basically divided into two. Uh, sections. One is like power processing section. This is the power processing section. And then we have this local control section. Okay. So this power processing section, it consists of this PWM inverter and output LC filter and a coupling inductor. Okay. So uh, this um, power, this PWM inverter, see, we know we are using like photovoltaic. So this DC is generated. So that DC is converted into pulsating AC by this PWM inverter. Now, this PWM, because it is producing pulsating AC, we need to use LC filter to attenuate high frequency harmonics or make the output ripple free or reduce the ripple at least. Okay. So for that purpose, we are using here LC filter. And then this coupling inductor, it is shaping basically the output impedance of this PWM inverter so that the coupling between the real and reactive power can be minimized. Okay, so this is like power processing section. And then the next is like local control section. So which has this outer power sharing controller and inner voltage and current controllers. So basically any mismatch in real and reactive power if there is any real and reactive power mismatch, then the sharing of that mismatch is obtained through this power sharing controller. So it determines like what should be the power generated, what should be the voltage output. Okay. So this is given as input to this voltage controller, and then this is the current controller. So these are the important parts, parts of IIDG units. Now to develop the state space model of the complete microgrid, which we have uh, considered. So we have divided the complete microgrid in three sub modules. One is generation sub module, then network sub module and load sub module. Now generation sub module also we have seen that this IIDG unit. It is comprising of outer loop power sharing controller, inner control comprising of voltage and current controller and then output LC filter and coupling inductance. So each one is giving like this gives third order. This is second, second order and six. So if you sum it up, one IIDG unit model, it comes up as a 13th order model. Okay. Then network or sub um, network sub module model. So we have considered lines. We have uh, mathematically modeled them as RL circuits. So this comes out to be second order. Then load sub module. If you consider this load sub module, so we have considered different kinds of loads. So static load, where we can consider active load sub module like RIL, which is of 10th order, passive load sub module, which is of like second order, uh, this R, RL, and CPL all are passive loads, so it's second order, and dynamic load sub module, which is of fifth order. Okay, so these different sub modules are there. Now uh, we will form the state space model of the microgrid by uh, using mapping matrices. Okay, so this mapping sub modules are mapped. Now, uh, like, uh, so if you see the uh, microgrid, you will observe that uh, uh, like this at any particular point, power will be either exported or imported at a node. Okay, so if like uh, you consider power or current, you can consider. So like we have considered the convention as um, minus one at a node if the current is away from the going away from the node and plus one if it is coming towards the node. So this convention we have used and with the help of these mapping matrices, a combined model state space model of the microgrid is obtained. So if you sum it up, all these 13 and then uh, three uh, lines. So six and then all these loads. Okay. So the total order comes out to be 77. So this is the state vector of uh, microgrid. So this order is of like 77. Okay. Now, uh, so this is the state variable 
and this state this is a state variable of the microgrid which comprises so of the state variables of generation submodule state variable of line submodule and state variations of the load uh, submodule okay so for this state variable of this generation submodule it comprises of the state variables of all the four iidg units and state variable of one iidg unit is comprises of so many uh, elements okay so this is like the angle between the reference and uh, local and the common reference frame then active and reactive power output of the ith iidg unit then this is for the voltage controller this is for related to the current controller then um, this filter current and then output voltage and currents of ith iidg unit okay so this is the line uh, vector active load induction motor and then this is the uh, control input vector. So this is disturbance vector we have considered because we have considered disturbance to be uh, load disturbance. Okay, and then this is the output vector. So this uh, I'm not going to discuss this because this involves itself a big mathematical thing. Okay, so but uh, in our paper we have given in the detail we have one we have published one paper on totally on like small signal modeling of the microgrid system. Okay, you can refer that or I can provide you that. So now case study. So we have developed this small signal state space model of the microgrid. Then we are, uh, are performing uh, this small signal stability analysis using eigenvalue and participation factor based uh, method. And we are also analyzing its dynamic performance by performing time domain simulation. And here, uh, we have considered IIDG units of unequal power ratings and because we have why I'm mentioning here that we have considered unequal power ratings because in literature uh, we have seen that people have used equal power rating DGs and we have basically analyzed also that equal power rating and unequal power ratings what is their impact on the stability analysis and we have also done the analysis after uh, connecting like different kind of loads, like which particular load is having what impact on the stability analysis. Okay, so uh, a detailed analysis has been carried out, but I'm not discussing that part here. I simply consider that we are having induction motor load connected at bus one. So we have connected induction motor load at bus one, then constant power load at bus two then rectify interface active load at bus 3 and a resistive load at bus 4. So this kind of load combination I have used in this particular presentation. So these are the uh, parameters of uh, this uh, system. These are, the, these are the parameters of uh, this system which we have taken. So you can see the DG ratings if you consider so it is going like it is in the increasing order from DG1 to DG4. The rating is we have increasing uh, ratings we have considered. And so therefore the group gains are also in that order. Then static, these are the static reactive power group gains for unequal power ratings, inverter parameters, RIL parameters, line parameters, and load parameters, different kind of loads we have taken. So all those parameters are given here. And then we have by performing this time step simulation, we have we have obtained this steady state initial operating conditions. So these are the voltages of the active uh, the DC sorry D axis voltages at bus, and this is the Q axis voltages at buses. This is for active load bus, and um, this is if you see this D axis current output current. So if this D axis output current, if you notice, it is proportional. Isn't it? it is proportional to the ratings of the IIDG units which we have assumed. So we can confirm from here that because it is the ratings are uh, in the increasing order, the currents also they are in the increasing same uh, increasing order. Or we can say the power sharing is proportional to their ratings. Okay. So this is like um, D and Q axis. So we usually use while solving this na, or developing this control techniques, we use DQ. Uh, reference frame. So therefore, D and Q axis voltages and currents are coming out. So this is like steady state parameters of induction motor load, steady state parameters of three lines and for R and CPL load. So these are the initial steady state operating point obtained. Once we obtain this initial steady state operating point, 
Then around this point, the equations were linearized and eigenvalue analysis was performed. So when we performed this analysis, we observed that there are six unstable modes. Okay. And if you see out of these six unstable modes, five modes were associated with active load, RIL, and one mode is associated with induction motor. So, um, active load, five modes are associated with active load. One mode is associated with induction motor. Okay. Now to uh, uh, find out like which modes are responsible for creating instability, we have performed participation factor analysis also. So participation factor, basically it is a measure of association between a particular mode and the state variable uh, call creating that mode. Okay, so we have observed here that these are the modes. Like one is like CPL associated with CPL. This is the L2. So inductance at uh, this uh, second uh, bus filter current L represents that. Then Q1 is the DG units one represented output current and voltage of QX is output voltage and current of uh, DG1. Okay, so these are the having maximum participation factors if we find it out. Then uh, after the six unstable modes, we have one inter area mode also, which is associated with induction motor. Okay. And then low damping medium frequency modes are there. So these low uh, damping medium frequency modes, they are associated with the IIDG one unit where we have connected induction motor. Load. Okay. So basically it is coming out that uh, where we have connected induction motor load that is resulting in low damping medium frequency modes. Okay, and these are the dominant states which are participating in creating this modes. So initially itself, we are observing that our system is unstable. Okay, with this particular dose because it is already known that CPL will make your system unstable because it is associated with the um, in negative incremental impedance. So it offers negative incremental impedance. So it creates instability in the system. RIL is also known to be um, of creating instability in the system. Okay. So, but we have considered in addition induction motor load and we found that all these kind of loads, they are uh, creating instability in the system. Now this shows you the dynamic response of IIDG units. So if you consider, see this, is IIDG1. So where we have connected induction motor load. So because of this inverter, uh, this induction motor load, there is a transient dip in frequency here. Okay. Whereas other other buses, there is not such significant change in the frequency. If you consider this act, active power uh, of the IIDG units, then see this is bus four where we have connected a large resistive load of about 25 kilowatt. So that is the reason this uh, transient rise is you can see here you have connected RIL so again this uh, significant variations are there and because of this induction motor load also this transient rise is there in active power response okay if you consider reactive power response here then in the reactive power response you have again because of the induction motor load there is a transient rise in reactive power response and you see where we have connected the CPL, it is showing you negative incremental impedance, which verif verifies its uh, characteristic of offering negative incremental impedance. Okay. And if you see the current, there are uh, significant transient excursions in current at bus one, uh, bus three. So it is significant transient excursions because of the RIL load and because of the induction motor load. So we have verified the results by performing time domain simulations also. So now what we observe here, okay, by performing this small signal stability analysis, we have observed that six low frequency modes are present, five associated with RIL and one associated with induction motor load. So they are lying in the right half plane. So they are the unstable modes. Then one inter area mode associated with induction motor is present. Then two pairs of low damping medium frequency modes associated with IIDG unit one is present. Okay, so this is revealed by the small signal stability analysis and dynamic response of IIDG units showed 
that presence of induction motor causes significant transient dip in frequency, transient rise in active as well as reactive power response and remarkable transient changes in output current. And presence of RIL causes significant oscillations in active power response and output current response and negative incremental resistance is offered by the CPL. So these are all observations by performing a small signal stability analysis and dynamic response of IADG units. So after performing this analysis, now we are able, we know that how our system is behaving. So now we are able to design the controller. Okay. So now I'll move to controller design. And here we are using like hierarchical controller. So uh, we have developed a two level PMU supported hierarchical controller. So you can see at each bus we have deployed PMUs. Okay, so as to main, uh, obtain better controllability also and better observability also. So at each bus we have deployed PMUs and this hierarchical controller, it consists of, if you see, it consists of a local decentralized controller for each IIDG unit. With each IIDG unit, we have provided one local decentralized controller and then it is uh, helped by one multi input and multi output centralized controller. Okay, so we have, as I told in the hierarchical, we have a local decentralized controller and then one centralized controller. So we have used that architecture here. So these, so uh, these four like uh, the local decentralized controllers are used. These, the purpose of using this local decentralized controller is to improve stability. So basically, these decentralized controllers are helping in improving the stability of the uh, microgrid. And um, this centralized controller, the purpose of using this centralized controller is to enhance the performance of each of this local decentralized controller by compensating the voltage and frequency deviations introduced by this local controller. Okay, so that is the purpose. So we are using, and this centralized controller, it requires communication. The, these um, centralized controller requires communication. So these communications are obtained through PMU. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, okay, the main advantage, the main advantage of this uh, structure is that if suppose this centralized controller fails, then also with the help of this local decentralized controller, we are able to uh, maintain or preserve the stability of the microgrid because decentralized controller is developed, it is improving the stability of the microgrid. And then this centralized controller is used to enhance the performance of these decentralized controllers. So if this fails, this centralized controller fails, then also we are able to preserve the stability of the microgrid. So now what is the design procedure okay, to develop this hierarchical control structure? So uh, first of all, this decentralized controller, it is incorporated in the small signal model of the microgrid. So we have already developed the small signal model of the microgrid. In that uh, small signal model, we are incorporating a decentralized controller model also. After developing that small signal model, okay, so if we are linearizing the nonlinear equations and then developing small signal model. So here the small signal model is available with decentralized controller and because we are using PMUs, so we want to reduce the cost associated with the installation of PMU. So what we are use, uh, doing, we are selecting certain inputs as well as output. Okay, so uh, this inputs and outputs. So we are uh, reducing, we are uh, selecting certain inputs and output signals. So that selection has been done using geometric measures approach that I'll explain uh, briefly in the next slide. So the selection of input and output signals is performed using geometric measures approach. After performing this geometric measures approach, we want to reduce the model order. 
of this microgrid. So we have seen that when we have not incorporated the centralized controller, the model order was um, 77. Okay, so as this microgrid, uh, if you in go on increasing the size of the microgrid, that model order will increase and obviously the complexity will also increase, but we do not want to do the same thing. So what we have done, we have reduced that model order to some value. Okay, so for that thing, we have used model order reduction technique and reduced the model order from, you will observe later that when we incorporate decentralized controller, the model order increases to 81. So we have reduced from that 81 to some other number. Okay, after incorporating model order, we have obtained this reduce, we have find out that what should be the order, optimal order. After obtaining the optimal order, we have reduced the full space model to reduce order model and incorporated this input and output signals selected. Okay, once this reduced order model is obtained, then we have augmented this reduced order model with disturbances noise model because we know we are utilizing the PMU measurements which may have some noises in them. Okay, so we have incorporated that. So that augmented model is then used to design the centralized controller. Okay, and before you give this like we have designed centralized controller, but the um, for controller designing, tuning the parameters is always very important. Okay, so we need to tune the parameters such that their operation is uh, satisfactory at the maximum possible operating conditions. So then after tuning these parameters, this controller outputs, they are provided to power sharing controller of IIDG units and DC voltage and AC current controllers of RIL. Okay, so this is the whole procedure to design the controller. So now the decentralized controller design. Okay, so this, see, this is a conventional power sharing controller, okay, which is providing this reference frequency and reference DX uh, output to the, uh, for this uh, thing. So, okay, so this is the output. Now, and we are using this uh, decentralized controller. So this decentralized controller, it is adding this auxiliary term, this auxiliary term and this auxiliary term to this conventional power sharing controller, which is modifying the reference frequency and reference DXS voltage, okay? So it is modifying this. So the uh, power uh, balancing will be different from the conventional power sharing controller. Okay, now you see that this is the active power gain of decentralized controller and this is the reactive power gain of the decentralized controller. Now, the, how this gain is obtained, if you see with the help of active power measurements from BAMS, we are obtaining the total power generation. Okay, and here we are obtaining the total reactive power generation. So this is the total power, uh, total active power and total reactive power generation we are obtaining. So this decentralized uh, controller, it is utilizing that information through VEMS that what is the total active and reactive power generation in the microgrid and what is the desired power sharing. This is the desired power sharing of microgrid. Okay, so this PI is the actual power sharing and this alpha PI is the desired power sharing. And alpha QI is the desired uh, reactive power sharing and QI is the actual reactive power sharing. So basically this at the auxiliary control terms, they are produced utilizing the information of total active and reactive power generation from VAMS and desired uh, active and uh, reactive power sharing. Based on this, these control terms are generated. Okay, now uh, here, if you see here, we have added one integral term also. This is because the uh, you know, like reactive power sharing using group characteristics, it is found to be inaccurate for microgrids. So to reduce that error, we have used here one integral term so that that can be reduced to, error can be reduced to zero. So these are the outputs, reference uh, frequency and reference uh, DXS voltage of the converters, IIDG units, okay? So now you see the small signal model. Now when we have incorporated uh, decentralized controller, it has become 81, okay? Uh, now, so once this decentralized controller is designed, then selection of input output signals. So for selection of input output signals, we have used geometric measures approach 
which utilizes this normalized and orthogonal eigenvectors ui and wi corresponding to the ith eigenvalue lambda i okay so this eigenvectors were obtained and then geometric measures of observability associated with the ith node it is defined as this so it is calculated then geometric measures of controllability associated with the ith node ith mode is defined as this one so we have once we have linearized uh, this um, model at uh, the steady state operating point we are getting these things and from there we can calculate the geometric measures of observability and controllability and a higher value of the observability and controllability measures represent the most observable and controllable input in damping the modes of interest respectively so following this thing we have considered the worst case of disturbance at all buses means we have applied the disturbance at all buses simultaneously we observed that most observable signals are 29 and most controllable signals are 12. so that is the reason you will see here that the output is like 29 and the input is 12. okay so this thing we have considered once we have selected this input output signals then we have performed model order reduction so sure balanced model reduction procedure is applied to the linearized model and then selected input output signals have been incorporated in the reduced order so to judge this figure it shows you the error bound with respect to the order of the linear model. So if you see this figure, uh, it is visible that at 40th order, this error bound, which is basically uh, the difference between maximum difference between the um, full order model and the reduced order model. Okay. So this error bound is substantially small, significantly small here, isn't it? It's almost like close to zero. So it means that we can accept the 40th order as the we can reduce from 81 to 40th order okay and if you reduce below 40 then what is happening this error bound is increasing significantly okay so this is how like we can see we observe that we can reduce our model this um, model order of uh, microgrid from 81 to 40 okay now this plot it shows you the singular value plots okay for different orders so this is like 81st order and this is 40th order. If you see this figure, you will see that this 40th order is almost indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the 81th order. But if you reduce the order below, then the error is significant. Okay. So we have confirmed from this that we can reduce our model to 80, 40th order. It means 40 state space variables will be there. Okay. So we have reduced from 81 to 40 and this model is used. So 40 state space variables are there, 29 outputs and 12 input signals are there. Okay. Now once this um, model order is reduced, then we have come to design the centralized controller. So uh, this reduced order model, which is augmented with noise and disturbance model, as I have shown you in the slide for design procedure. This model is transformed to the model canonical form using the real shirt decomposition. See, all these are different techniques and it is not possible for me to give the uh, details of all these techniques. So if anyone is interested, you can go into the depth of that one. And the transformation matrix, it relates the original state variables and the decoupled model variables. Okay. And this so here you have obtained model form of reduced order model of the microgrid with selected input. We have obtained the model augmented model. It is used to design the center based on extended QG control approach. Okay, so we have to design like optimal current uh, state estimator also to observe this. And then rather than using like linear quadratic Gaussian approach, we are using here like linear quadratic regulator with prescribed degree of stability. The reason for using this LQR PDS is that it ensures some minimum distance from the imaginary axis. We have seen that six modes were lying in the right half plane and we want to ensure that our system is stable at any operating condition. So this LQR PDS it has it, in this uh, we have to prescribe a degree of stability which is known as alpha so uh, if you this thing ensures 
you keep some value of alpha which will ensure that this minimum distance will be always maintained from the imaginary axis so it will prevent your system from going into the unstable region so that is the reason behind using this lqr pds so this central control problem is again divided into two sub problems as shown in the previous slide one is the optimal estimate of the state and optimal output feedback control problems okay so the op optimal state estimation it is based on kalman estimator theory and the out optimal output feedback control is based on lqr pds and the gain matrix of both the optimal output feedback control and the optimal state estimator is dependent diagonal weighting matrices so once we design this but the controller design means it has to come with the tuning parameters also we'll go with the tuning parameters in the next slide so here like you will see here the signals from centralized controller is obtained and it is given here okay so this is modifying basically it is modulating the output of this modified power sharing controller it is modulating and basically this ucci is nothing but it is a voltage correction signal okay so it modulates this reference voltage of modified power sharing controller so this new reference is obtained which is given as input to this voltage controller and this one modifies this output current okay dq axis reference current of this uh, controller so this because it is the input to the current controller it is modifying the reference of this dq axis uh, voltage of uh, this current controller so this is how in turn this signal is modified this output it is modifying this output and it is modifying this output okay now this centralized controller so the whatever the control uh, signals are obtained from the centralized controller they are given to power sharing controller and they are also given to ac current controller and dc voltage controller of rrl so here like we are giving this signal from the centralized controller this is again the reference the signal so this is given to q axis ac current controller of ril which is modifying this axis this reference and this is like the voltage controller so it is modifying this reference of this and ultimately modifying this output of this okay so these uh, controls are given here now the design is incomplete without obtaining the uh, without obtaining the optimal setting of the control parameters isn't so control parameters now see we cannot use because there are wide variety of operating conditions need to be considered and trial and error method is usually not considered to be suitable because for that you need to have a la uh, good amount of experience also and uh, it will not uh, set the optimal um, the parameters optimally so to obtain the optimal parameters of both the centralized controller and decentralized controller we have formulated a by objective optimization problem okay so we wanted our controller that it should be able to provide good transient response this was our one objective and we also wanted that our controller should be Excuse me. Yes, yes. Shall I continue now? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I have muted all, everyone. <laughs> okay, okay. So our objective was that our controller should provide good transient response. And the other objective was that it should be able to sustain small signal disturbances. Okay, so with these objectives in mind, we formulated our by objective optimization problem to minimize is the uh, optimal output uh, uh, feedback control gain matrix and minimize the condition this is the second norm so minimize the second norm of the optimal output feedback control gain matrix and also to minimize the condition number of the eigen vector matrix okay of the closed loop iamg so these were the two objectives and these objectives were conflicting in nature it means like if you want to Im obtain improvement in one so this x is basically the decision variable which comprises of like this kpdc so we have four iidg units and four as a local decentralized controller so 
this is the active power gain of the four decentralized controller then x2 is the four um, reactive power uh, four reactive power gain of this decentralized controller and then these are this comprises of like uh, this is uh, represents um, estimator kalman estimator so diagonal elements of this qfmg and rfmg and this is uh, diagonal elements of output uh, feedback control matrix okay so all these parameters are obtained by solving this uh, by objective optimization problem now since this objectives were conflicting in nature we have used non dominated sorting genetic algorithm okay to obtain the uh, which will provide basically the a set of perit optimal solutions okay so these two parameters which we have set like this and after solving this we have obtained potentially 28 number of perit optimal solutions were obtained okay now out of this 28 number of perit optimal solutions we need to identify the most effective Perito optimal solution. To obtain the most effective Perito optimal solution, we have performed post Perito analysis. In post Perito analysis, what we have done, we have clustered this 28 number of Perito optimal solutions into different clusters using K means algorithm. Okay, so uh, we have uh, basically we have used two clusters, so we have divided it here. Now you have two clusters, and each cluster will have a representative solution which will be basically close to the cluster centroid. Okay, so this is the representative solution. Now, out of this cluster, how to select uh, which one will be better? Okay, so basically, for this, we need to consider knee cluster. Knee cluster means a uh, 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 cluster where you are have, um, making a small change in one of the objective function and you are obtaining a large deterioration in the other. So that is considered as the uh, knee cluster. So here we have obtained that uh, this number of solutions like this cluster one is the knee cluster and the representative solution is 10. So this is obtained as the optimal uh, most effective parent optimal solution. Okay, now the question also like uh, I have shown here uh, minimal things here, but how do we decide like we should have only two clusters. So for that also we have done, we have used uh, like um, with a different number of clusters and we have obtained cell Houty coefficient which basically um, measures the closeness of the solution with the cluster center. So higher value of cell Houty coefficient, that number of clusters have been, clusters have been obtained. Okay, but at this moment of time, you may not need to go into the that much detail. Once you start working, then um, gradually you can start going into the that much detail. Okay, so this is how we have obtained this optimal solution, and then these are the tuned parameters of the hierarchical controller. So this is like um, active power uh, gain of the centralized reactive power gain of decentralized controller. Then this centralized controller. So these are the parameters of Kalman estimator and optimal state feedback control. Okay. So once we obtain the tuned parameters of the hierarchical controller, uh, then we performed eigenvalue based performance assessment. Okay. So this shows you open loop IAMG where the six uh, modes we have seen that they were here seven modes. I think now it is uh, seven modes are coming. The unstable. So this is there and then based uh, hierarchical controller and this we have obtained where we use directly state based hierarchical controller. So <clears throat> it is compared. So and we have uh, put we have used like prescribed degree of stability value that we have considered as 100. So you can see here because we have alpha we have used 100. That much distance from the image pieces in both the cases. Okay, so the, you'll observe that in both the cases it is able to maintain that alpha is equal to 100. So that distance it is able to maintain from the imaginary axis. So this is the using LQR PDS. And this table also shows the same thing. So you can uh, observe the values here that these are the modes which are unstable. So all these seven modes they are lying in the right half plane. But when we are using a state based hierarchical controller, so it is shifted to the left half plane. So all these modes are stabilized. And then with the proposed hierarchical controller also, it is stabilized. 
but if you see the difference in the damping factor then you will observe that the damping factor offered by the proposed hierarchical controller was higher and this low damping modes also the damping is improved by using this controllers so here this is how like eigen value based performance assessment is done and now this time domain simulation for the linear model okay so whatever linearized model we have obtained by linearizing it is this steady state operating point we have performed time domain simulation on the, that linear model to confirm the results obtained using eigen value based analysis if you see here this is like open this are the two figures for open loop for iimg so here this frequency deviation in frequency is continuously increasing so you can judge that the system is unstable and here the bus voltages also they are also increasing so uh, it is unstable but when we have used it with the state based and the proposed hierarchical controller you can see that but here now it is settled okay so now if you compare this state based and this proposed hierarchical the here the amplitude peak amplitude so it is higher with the state based and it is taking long time in comparison to the proposed one to settle the uh, deviations okay so this proposed one is better now this shows the uh, deviations in voltage it's at bus 1 bus 2 bus 3 and bus 4 so in each and every case the observations will be similar see here this proposed one is offering less peak amplitude is it and settling also quite fast so like we, we are able to uh, convinced with the performance of the uh, proposed uh, controller okay so this uh, shows the like details in terms of settling time peak amplitude and peak overshoot so if you see it here the peak amplitude and settling time of the proposed uh, two level hierarchical controller so it is settling time is less it is settling quickly and the peak amplitude is also less okay now time domain simulation results using non linear model of the microwave so for this what we have done we have considered that during 0 to 1 seconds it is no disturbances made so it is a steady state period and then at 1 second what we are doing we are injecting we are uh, actually uh, um, this uh, we are applying a small signal disturbance of about like 2 kilowatt at each bus at all the four buses a small disturbance of about 2 kilowatt is applied and during 1 to 2 seconds the controller is not activated okay the, so that we can easily compare the performance at 2 seconds this controller this controller is activated so at 2 seconds controller is activated and then it is there till 3 seconds so at 3 seconds disturbance is also removed and the controller is also removed so this is how we have divided this period like 0 to 1 and 3 to 4 is a steady state period and then 1 to 2 seconds is open loop period and 2 to 3 is closed loop period okay so like frequency you can see at all the four buses so this is 1 to 2 so you can see considerable oscillations are there but after 2 seconds as soon as the controller is activated these deviations are settled quickly okay then this shows like active power response so we have performed the simulation for like 10 second but i'm not showing it here this is like open loop period 1.2 to 1.8 and then 2.2 to 2.8 when the controller is there okay so you see there are sufficient uh, like specifically if you consider this iidg2 where cpl is connected and uh, induction motor load is connected oscillations are significant okay where is this bus 4 where we have connected resistor the oscillations are not there okay so but all these oscillation they are settled during when the uh, this is activated the controller is activated here this shows the response of current output current of this 4 dg unit so again you can observe the oscillations here but during the um, this disturbance control period closed loop control period this is uh, oscillations are settled okay so this are like time domain simulation results for bus voltages so because the time step was quite less you are observing it like this okay i'll show you in the next slide with for a small duration 
So 1.2 to 1.9, it is open loop uh, period, and then it is closed loop. So the deviations are settled. Now you will see the zoomed view. So see, this is from 1.85 to 1.9. The oscillations are there, but then you see the variations are very small here. It is there, but it is very small. Okay. Then this is the three phase output current of the IIDG unit. So this is for one, two, three, four. So this is during the open loop period. So significant oscillations are there. And these oscillations are maintained during 2.5 to 2.7. Okay. Then this is active power of this uh, RIAL act, uh, active load. Okay, so again, the oscillations are minimized here, like here, these oscillations are there, so that are minimized in this case. And then DC voltage of the voltage controller of the RIAL, again, these kind of oscillations, you will not see it here. And then this is the speed of induction motor. So that is also showing significant oscillations during this period, which are not present. And this is the torque of the induction motor. So like this, how we have confirmed the performance of our controller. Okay. So the um, now we can conclude here that the proposed hierarchical controller, it provides supplementary control signals to the modified power sharing controller of each IIDG unit, as well as the DC voltage and AC current controllers of the RIA. Okay. So the centralized control signals, centralized controller, it is providing the commands to modify power sharing controller and DC voltage and AC current controllers of the RIL. And the supplementary control signals were able to stabilize the unstable modes which are caused by dynamics of CPL and RIL. Further, these signals also improve the damping ratios of the low damping modes caused by the dynamics of the first IIDG unit corresponding to the connection of dynamic induction motor load. And the proposed hierarchical controller was able to settle the deviation in the frequency and the voltage at the four buses within 30 to 45 milliseconds. And it provides faster response than the hierarchical controller based on state-based extended LQG approach. Okay. So here I finish this thing. And now it is open to question answers. So thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, such an elaborative uh, lecture in this faculty development program. Uh, so now I would like to ask uh, audience if you, you have any question, you may unmute yourself and you can ask directly. Yes, any question? I think uh, if everyone is. Interested. Yes, yes. Question. No, I was just saying because I understand a lot of things are there and they if like anyone is not able to understand or having any doubts or want to go into the depth of this one, I would suggest that because uh, while doing this work, this was the work done by one of my PhD students and he was able to publish this work in IEEE transactions on industrial informatics. But while doing this work, he struggled a lot to understand the mathematical modeling of the microgrid systems. Okay, so uh, like uh, the uh, participants, they can contact me on my email ID if they need any help, like uh, because we have published, we, uh, we found that time that it was so difficult initially to model all these things and uh, to develop the small signal uh, state space model of the microgrid. We published a paper only to so that uh, and in depth, every step has been given in detail so that uh, students uh, can read them and go through them to understand the modeling process of the uh, microgrid. Okay, so I would suggest that they can uh, go and look into that paper.
and we have developed actually a decentralized centralized controller also they also have been developed and we found from secretary okay so this is what i was saying in the starting na somebody asked for control techniques that you need to do the configuration of the uh, test system accordingly you can develop the control techniques it is not necessary that each and every uh, control technique will perform on each kind of microgrids okay then thank you ma'am uh, with this we came to the end of this uh, session so participants are requested to uh, uh, you may ask uh, that uh, whatever your doubt is there you may contact uh, through email and uh, refer the paper for more details so thank you everyone so thank you dr